before we start, uh, I want to ask a question. How many people are coming for the ultrasonic ranging detector thing we mentioned in the abstract? OK, so I need to apologize to you because it's not going to be included in this class. We do have a solution with an 8-bit device on the ultrasonic ranging detecting, but uh, we made a mistake to put it in the abstract. So if you are interested in that application, please contact us. We have already have a solution for that. We have the code, we have the even the schematic, and we can provide it to you. All right, <laughs> so let's get started. How many of you guys heard the term CIP? I would expect most of us have heard the term CIP. So that's short for Core ind Independent Peripheral. So, and that's the topic we're talking about <coughs> in this class. So this year's master's we're having four core independent peripheral classes. And we have the CIP class on motor control, the CIP class on data communication, we have the CIP class on mixed signal, dete uh, mixed signal uh, detecting. So um, this class is the only class that talks about the only one peripheral that's called configurable logic cell. So why is that? Why do we find it really important to you guys to just talk about this one peripheral. Hopefully, we're going to find out in this class. Okay. So when you walk out of this classroom, you'll be able to, of course, configure and use the configurable logic cell. And also, you'll be able to combine other peripherals with using the CLC. And last but, but not least, we want you guys to be able to be inspired in this class and to apply CLC to your own application. All right, here's the agenda of the class. First, I'm going to do a brief introduction to the CIP and the CLC. And then we're going to introduce some design uses in general. And then some application examples that's applied in the real world. And then the summary. I probably need to introduce myself and the guys here first. So my name is Daniel Hall. I've been working with Microchip for two years. Uh, as an MCU8 applications engineer. This is Rob Brown. He's an, also an MCU8 applications en engineer. I don't remember how many years has he been working with Microchip. 16. 16, all right. This is Justin Osha. He works in MCU16 and also as an applications engineer for four years. Yes. All right. <coughs> so we've got uh, a lot of things to cover today, so let's get started. So first is the introduction to the CIP. What is CIP? It's called the Core Independent Peripheral. So by reading the name, you kind of get an idea what a CIP is. It's a peripheral that can do its own job without the CPU interfering with it, or with the minimum interference of the CPU. So it's self-sustaining. So think of the CIP as a tool that you can use. So the CPU is free, it's burdened. So if you have a bunch of the CIPs, you kind of have a toolbox, and you have different tools that can be used in different areas. So that's the last point I, I need to make. So a collection of peripherals that can coordinate with each other, and then you can complete a more complex task based on that. But keep in mind, so how do we do that? We'll come back to it later. So here is an example of how the CI, what the CIT, CIP brings you to your own application. Suppose you have an old application that runs one millisecond loop. And with the usage of CIP, you can actually just use the CPU for 200 microseconds to deal with the input and output of the peripherals, and it does the job for you. Now, with the 200 microsecond used by the CPU, what extra things you can do is to put your CPU into sleep for the rest of time, right? So that it saves power. And then another thing you can do is to just slow down the clock so that it also saves power and EMI. And moreover, you can add some more secret sauce. By secret sauce, we mean that add some more new extra features to your application so it could be more competitive. An example I can think of is that an application we did to our customer so it, it was for an induction cooktop. So before, they were using a pure software solution so that um, 
the CPU will run at the full time and uh, it only deals with controlling of the inductor. And now with the CIP, I think <coughs> the CLC, the hardware limit timer, the induction cooktop control is uh, dealt with the peripherals themselves. And then the CP since the CPU are freed, they use that to do a touchpad control. So they added really a cool new feature to their applications to be more competitive. All right. After introduction to the CIP, any questions on that, by the way? All right, cool. We're going to introduce about our topic today, the configurable logic cell, so called the CLC. All right. Actually, it's pretty straightforward. It's a combination of all the logic components. For each CLC, you're going to have a logic block with different options to combine those logic components together. For the logic components, we have gates, like AND gates, OR gates. We have flip-flops. We have latches. And then it has a flexibility to connect the internal and external signals with other peripherals. Now I'm going to come back to the previous point I made for combining those peripherals and coordinating with each other. So how do we do that? Actually, the CLC is the solution. Since it has the uh, interconnectivity with all the internal and external signals, we can actually use that to combine um, your other peripherals together to coordinating with each other. And also, we can, com we can apply some complex logic to that. All right, here are some features of the CLC. It's one logic block with four inputs and one output. And for the logic block, you can select such and such different combinations. You have all kinds of op options. So I'm going to show you on this screen later. And then inputs can be selectable for nearly every peripheral or IO pins. And output can be steered to uh, other peripherals or another, CI, uh, another CLC. And here are some benefits the CLC brings us. First is to reduce the component count and the PCB area. This is really easy to understand. So before, if you want to do some logic uh, components, you need to actually apply it on the board. Now you just need one microcontroller, and it does all the job for you. Another thing is the fast event response. When you're doing some, something in software, you're going to use your, so you're going to speed up your clock and use the software to, software to do that. And it's not even fast enough. But <coughs> with the CLC, it's pure hardware. So the only delay you're getting is the propagation delay, which is a, a few nanoseconds. Another thing is the core independent operation. As all the core independent peripheral has, it's core independent. It doesn't, um, it doesn't have has a CPU to be interfering with it. And it also operates while in sleep mode. So you can actually put your CPU to sleep. And once you complete a con condition, the CLC can tell the CPU to wake up. That leads to my last point. It creates a complex wake up condition. All right. And most importantly, we call it the CLC the glue, because it's re it really glues all the other peripherals together to complete a more complex task. As you can see on the screen, we have a bunch of different inputs from different peripherals, even with the interrupt signals and external signals to for the input of the CLC. And the output, we also have different um, peripherals signals. I'm not even listing all of the signals because the screen won't be big enough to hold that. <coughs> and please note that the CLC also can be routed to another CLC. That means you can have two CLC cascaded with each other and do some even more complex job. All right. After talking all of the benefits and how the CLC works, so really, how do we use it? Um, after all, it's a peripheral. So we need to configure all those registers in order to use that. Now, I know in the old days where when uh, Ward and the guys actually designed this peripheral, they actually have to configure each register to make the peripheral works. Remember that how many um, inputs and outputs I've been talking about, you have to configure each register for that. And that's such a pain. 
So me, I'm like a spot chart when I enter the company because this tool is already there when I enter the company. It's called the MPLAB Code Configurator, so called the MCC. So it's a graphical tool that can configure all the registers for you and do the initialization. In that way, you can directly uh, apply your applications in your code. And then it also has some built-in functions that you can directly use. Now, speaking of that, let's just simply open that. So I've, been, I've opened up MCC. So I'm going to just st start from scratch so you guys can see it clearly. So when you open up MCC, uh, I mean MPLAB, sorry, you go to Tools, Embedded, and open up the MPLAB Code Configurator. Can people in the back see? I, I know it's a little bit uh, small, but uh, there's really small things I can do. <coughs> and when you open up the MCC, simply just go to the device resources. It's gonna, the CLC is going to be here. Our device we're using today is the uh, 16F1619. It has four CLCs. So I just double click one to bring it up. Now it's in the system. So in the main screen of the CLC, you can see there's a mode selection. And that's the components combination I've been talking about. So you can have a D flip flop with an S and R. All kinds of different components combinations. And if I zoom in a little bit here, this is the four inputs I've been talking about. If you click the input, notice how small the bar is. That shows you how many signals you can put into the input. You have the time overflow signals, the, the zero cross detect output. You can all put it into the input. And how you configure this to, into a logic block is just simply just click on this. And now you're connected to this gate with the first input. If you click again, it's going to be an invert. And you can do an invert in other logic components. Please note that, so if I zoom in, all the logic components are actually grounded if you're not connected. So that means we have the all gate here. If I want to route a signal, say, from the PWM and just simply route it out to the CLC output, then since this is an end gate, this is zero, it's, gonna be, it's not going to work because this is, it's going to output in zero, right? So what I will do is just to add an invert here, and then it's going to solve the problem. All right. Any questions on the, on the GUI? We're, we're going to have an open, yes? Yes, it's, it's uh, hardware grounded, so it's got to be zero. Um, what was I talking about? So we're going to have an open lab session, and you guys can actually have a chance to configure the CLCs by using the MCC by yourself. So if you're interested, welcome to come. All right, let's switch to this screen. After talking about the MCC, here are some configuration for, of the MCC that I have already demoed. We have the gate selections, different gates, different components. We have the input source selection. And here we have connection and inverter. So you, ha you can add an inverter here, and you can connect over there, and you double click it, and then it's an invert. The gate selection for the input and the output. OK, one thing I forgot to dem demo is that uh, the pin manager grid at the very bottom. Here you can select your CI CLC input to be an I.O. pin. And then on the CLC out, you can select uh, whatever pins you want to be output. You can even select multiple pins to be output. All right, after talking about the, a brief introduction, is there a question? Okay. So let's go to some general design uses that use CLC to, com to 
uh, do some uh, peripheral interconnection. The first design use I can think of is core independent logic operations. That's what they're designed to be. So if you think about the logic operations, you can really think about two kinds of operations. One is a combinational logic, where you have all kinds of different conditions that happens at the same time, and you need some logic to apply to it. Another thing I can think of is a sequential logic. So in a short word, it's a state machine. So it's based on your previous state and the present state, and you come up with the new state. Let's take a look at the combinational logic first. Suppose we have an application that has the truth table on the left. And if you all work out the math, you can get the Boolean expression uh, at the very bottom. So it shows us that if A, the signal A is high, and B or C is high, it's gonna tr uh, so the output is going to be 1. So a, a simple example I can think of is that if you need a timing and to check your two comparators in your applications, you're saying when the timer overflows and either of your comparator goes high, then you're going to do something. So that's kind of an application that applies. All right. Before we talk about how to use a CLC, we always talk about how to do it in a traditional way. So in a traditional way, I mean a software way to do it, simply just apply to if statement, right? So if A is high, and then if B or C is high, you're going to do something. That looks pretty simple, but if you have some more complex logic here, then it's going to use up your CPU space. Now, another easy way to do it is just to apply two gates to that, one OR gate and one AND gate. And how do we apply that? Simply just use one CLC. It has a gate combination of that, and you can just select your ABC input, and then it does a job for you. Now you can put your CPU into sleep, and then you're going to tell CPU, oh, so the timer has overflow, and one of the comparator has goes high, and then the CPU can wake up and just do something. That really applies to your own applications. So I want you to note that by ABC, I not only means the input of the IO pin, it can also mean the input from other peripherals. And that's the point we're making the whole time in this class, to interconnect with other peripherals. So it also has a re faster response, since it's all hardware. OK, after talking about the com combinational logic, another new way I can think of to use the CLC is the sequential logic, basically a state machine. Suppose I have a really ancient vending machine here that only takes dimes and nickels, and it takes two nickels or one dime to vend the uh, water to you. And we can work out a state table like that, right? Uh, again, how do we do it in software? Simply, it's a state machine, so a case a switch statement. Case one, two, three, and then do something. How about a new way to do it? So by applying this state table online, and there are like plenty of tutorials to walk you through how to use a state table to come up with a flip-flop state machine. And now we can use two JK flip-flops and some a bunch of AND or OR gates to do the job for you. Now, with this hardware circuit, we are actually applying a simple state machine. With that said, I have four CLCs to do the job. And then CPUs are not even required in this situation, where before the CPU is fully used to do the state machine. So this is really a new way to think about using the CLC to do a simple state machine instead of other like combinational logic. So after some condition is achieved, then the CPU can execute your vending function. After the two core independent logic operations we talked about, we're going to talk about a new design use, a 
a capture real-time data. It's pretty st straightforward and simple. Suppose you're not using an interrupt, you're just using a code to detecting a rising edge in your application. And then what you will do is in a while one loop, you just check it periodically and see if the signal goes high, right? So it's easy that if the edge is really narrow and then you just miss it. Here's a missed pass. And now with a CLC, you can actually apply a delatch to it so that every time there's a rising edge, there, there's no chance to miss it. And you can put your CPU into sleep or you can have your CPU to do other jobs and check it in an even longer period and see if a rising edge has occurred because it turns high whenever a rising edge occurs. So it, it's never a chance for you to miss a pause. Okay, I've talked about three design uses and there are some other design uses I can think of like complex waveform generation by complex waveform generation, I mean like there are some uh, difficult protocols that actually you can do some, you, you, can, you need to do some bit banning to, to fulfill the protocol. You can actually use a combination of the CLC and other communication peripherals to do that. Internal synchronous routing, no need to talk more about it. And then there's a logic probe where there are some signals like timer overflow signals that you can never see it outside the <coughs> microcontroller by just bringing the signal out because there is no peripheral pin select on that. And now you can use a CLC to bring it out. That helps a lot when, when we are doing debugging. I do it the whole, the, all the time. When I want to see a signal and I don't want it to run in a debug mode, you can actually program the device, bring the, bring the signal out using the CLC and just scope it. All right, pop quiz. Actually a really easy one. So name three de CLC de design uses. I've talked uh, six of them. And there are just three showed up on the screen. Signal routing. Signal routing. Okay. All right, I'm just gonna show you guys the answer. So that's the six design uses I've been talking about. Two logic operations. Real-time data capture, complex waveform generation, internal signal routing, and logic probe. All right, after talking about the design uses in general, we're gonna talk about some real-world application examples. Now, Ward is gonna, I'm gonna switch it to Ward. Okay, can everybody hear me? Okay, sorry for the delay. So as Daniel mentioned, I mean, I, I was around when this peripheral was uh, developed, and with all peripherals, um, marketing usually comes to us, the marketing people, and they say, well, give us some examples because we want to be able to present this to the public. Well, with most peripherals, they're designed with a specific purpose in mind. And when they asked us for examples on, on this particular CLC, uh, everyone drew a blank. It's like, I can't think of any examples. It's because it wasn't developed for anything. It's more or less, it's, it was a peripheral that was developed to solve problems. Like a lot of times you'd have a, an application and say, I, if I just had an external gate or, or a flip-flop or something, I'd have to add that. So we brought them inside the device and as we came up with, with problems that were solved with this device, that's when we came up with the application. So here's, I'm going to present <coughs> four, where are we here? Four applications that, that I've actually done. These are real world applications. Either a customer needed this or it was something I was doing on my own um, or something just so that we found a need and this was a way to solve it. So I'll present those here as these. Here's the first one as a fairly simple one. Zero cross detection jitter filter. Of course, a zero cross detection is another one of those um, peripherals that, that was developed to, to solve a problem. The problem was that people wanted to sense an AC waveform, say the line uh, frequency or, or events uh, from like the 120 volt or 240 volt line. And they use a limiting, a current limiting resistor. And before there were analog inputs to the device that worked. But the analog inputs created a problem because even though you had a current limiting resistor, the voltage would go above and, and would depend on the 
ESD protection diodes, and when, when you went to that voltage, it actually went past the analog pass gate. So, and since now most pins have analog functions on them, you can't do that technique at all. So they made a zero cost detection that would take care of that, and the way the zero cost detection works is it holds the pin at a constant voltage, about 0.7 volts, and sources or sinks current to keep it there depending on what the input is. Now because it's very sensitive, I mean if you have a long rise or fall time, that actually there's no hysteresis because that would interfere with a zero crossing event. So it was very sensitive and very susceptible to jitter. So we said, well how do we solve that? And this was a CLC solution for that problem. So the purpose was to remove the state change jitter from the ZCD output, and we're just using the CLC, a ZCD, and a timer to do that. So we're going to put these three peripherals together to solve that problem. So here's a picture of the problem. Here's your AC waveform coming in. Here's the three things shown here as a puzzle piece is glued together. Uh, and you can see on the output here that when there's changes here that the first change, it happens immediately. This is the output we're looking for minus the jitter. Uh, and when it goes through low here, and I'm gonna ask questions throughout this because I want audience participation. Does anybody see the error in this timing diagram? I'm, I'm waiting for an answer. I'm not going on until I get an answer. An error, an error in the last diagram? There's an error in this, in this diagram. The last uh, falling edge is... Right. Right here, this last falling edge should have occurred right here, so there's the mistake. So anyways, how are we gonna do this? So we're gonna do it with this. Uh, you can see over here that there's just a state, something when the zero cross detection comes in, it's either gonna set or reset it. And the way this works is if it's, if the last state was low, so it gets propagated through here, this is a master-slave configuration. So at the beginning, everything's low, as opposed, so this gets clocked through and everything's low. So these two inputs, which is this input, the last state of this and the last state of this are both low, so it's set up to accept a high signal. So when the signal comes in, it goes high, the output immediately goes high, and that's what we see on the output over here. And then timer zero then clocks it through to this one. So it's, it's immediately inhibited by the event, and it's not, it's not going to enable this one, so uh, both of them are inhibited, is not going to enable this one until this propagates all the way through here. So that means that my jitter filter is at least one time or zero period and as much as two time or zero periods because if this was just about ready to clock when the signal came in, it's going to be at least one more before it propagates through. So it's one to two time or zero periods for the jitter filter. Now when they're both high, it's propagated through, it says I'm both high, and when zero, zero cost goes low, then it's gonna reset and do the other one. So that's my jitter filter. Sir? Yes? Uh, when you speak about the timer zero, it's the overflow from FF to zero? Yes, that's, that's what it is. It's the overflow out of timer zero. And here's a timing diagram showing what's going on. So CLC1 is actually the output, CLC2 is the intermediate stage of the master slave and CLC3, it's the end of these two that it, that's the enable. So it's not enabled until here and it's not enabled for the next transition until here. And you can just see it going through. <coughs> Here's the implementation. This is actually a picture before we had MCC, we had a CLC configuration tool and this is taken from that. So you can see here, now if you recall, it was supposed to be two AND gates, but we don't have AND gates in the inputs here, and I need this SR flop. So this is one of the eight configurations I can select. Uh, so what do we do about that? So if you know De Morgan's theorem for uh, logic, that the, the way it was explained to me years ago, and that's, it's, it's a method I like to remember, that's the way I, I remember it, is if you take this bubble and push it through the gate, it changes the gate, and then it appears as bubbles on the input. So this becomes a bubble, that's not a bubble, this is a, this is a bubble. So this is a AND gate where the, the zero cross input is high and it requires the other two signals low, which is CLC1 and if you come down here, CLC3. So one and three are when they're both low and the high will come in and set it. Likewise, this one's also an AND gate, but in this case, 
when these are both high and this is low, it'll come through and reset it. While I've got this picture up here, I just want to mention something, and I know Daniel mentioned it or alluded to it previously. If I wanted to preset this or reset this, I can do that because none of these inputs are, are, are enabled here. I think of this as a, as a no input or gate. Uh, you could also think of it as all four inputs being grounded, but as a, as a no input or gate, if I, the output's going to be low, and if I invert the output, then it becomes a high. So I've got a, a CPU control over setting and resetting any of these signals just by inverting the output. And this output is controlled by one bit in a polarity register for this. So it's, a, it's fairly easy to do that. And I use this a lot just, just for generating uh, ones and zeros through the, through the logic. The next two stages were just this configuration where it's simply, it's a, the input is the CLC one out and it's clocked by coming down here, which is a timer zero overflow. So when the input is, is high and the overflow happens, then it propagates out of this, same way with this. And except in this case, it's CLC two as the input and the, the timer zero overflow on the clock. So any questions about any of that? So what we have here is the CLC one, RS flip-flop holds the ZCD state. CLC two and three are the master slave configuration for uh, the jitter timer and timer zero determines the period. <coughs> Excuse me. The next one is a AC synchronous PWM. And somebody, this was actually for a customer request. He said he wanted to generate a 10-bit PWM <coughs> that was synchronous with an AC input. So for that, we can use a CLC, the zero cost detection, a PWM, but in this case, it's not being used as a PWM. It's being used to generate a voltage because I need uh, 10 bits of resolution. I don't have a 10-bit DAC, so I'm going to use this PWM as a DAC, a comparator, op amp, and a DAC for something else. So here you can see that here's the AC import, uh, input. It's about 20 mic uh, microsecond period, and he wants this PWM to be synchronous with these zero-crossing events and create a PWM pulse at each one. So there's a lot more circuitry here, but the CLC glues it all together. And I'll just, yes? Is this a dimmer? It's good. The, well, I don't know what he was asking, but it certainly it could be a dimmer, something like that, or a, a power control for an oven or, or whatever. But it's synchronous with AC waveform. Of course, I mean, the advantage to that is that you've got no EMI at the sw switching point, so that it reduces all that. There's, there's other clever ways to do that, but that's not, I mean, I, I could spend all day doing applications here. There's another one where you can actually cycle pulse or cycle skip and get the same thing without PWMing it, but that's, like I say, a different, different class. So all the components here, uh, th this is a constant current source, so the idea here is that this op amp, the DAC sets the voltage, and that sets the voltage at this point through this transistor. The voltage across the resistor is a current, so this is a constant current source into this capacitor, which means that the capacitor will charge at a linear rate. So I've got a linear charge on the cap that I can discharge through here. Now this, this is actually another peripheral. The, it's implied here. You can see that the CLC comes out on two pins, and I can select multiple pins on the CLC with the PPS controls. That's, that's the peripheral pin select. I select one that I'm going to configure for open drain, and that way when it's driven low, it shorts out the, the cap, and when it's driven high, it allows the cap to charge up. The other one is my digital output, so it's driven high and low, so I've got both signals here, from same source but different functions. On this down here, here's the PWM3. This is a 10-bit PWM, so that's how I'm getting my 10-bit resolution because it's simply charging up this cap to provide a voltage, which is the reference for this, which is my threshold for when this is going to trip. So that comes in. And it's all synchronized through the zero cost detection here. So here comes another question. You can see, in this case, I've got this AC coupled coming into the input here. What do you suppose that cap is going to do to the zero crossing input? Somebody. 
going to give me a phase shift. So the phase shift now, a little trickier, is that phase shift going to lead or lag the zero crossing event? It's going to lead it. Right. So in other words, I'm going to get a zero crossing event before it happens, which is kind of neat because now I can adjust this and lead or lag, or by putting a timing element here, I can have an event before or after the actual zero cross event. So another timing element here, not shown here, but certainly a hardware limit timer would do that trick and precisely handle that delay, that phase shift. So I think that covers everything. Got the comparator. Any questions about any of this? So the question is now, what's in this block? And it's practically nothing. It's exclusive OR and a deep flip flop. And the idea is that when everything's low here, starts out low, they're both low, this is low, and it's holding that cap in a discharge state. The zero cross event happens and immediately goes high here, or yeah, right, this one goes high. So now I've got an output that's allowing the cap to charge up. And when the comparator reaches the threshold, it triggers this to the high and shuts this off. And waiting for the next cycle, which is when this goes low, that goes low when this is high, same thing. This, this then releases the, the shorting on the cap and allows the comparator, when it reaches the threshold, <coughs> to, to trigger it again. So the timing diagram for that is, is this. Because the zero, zero cost detect CLC1 is actually my output, but it's also the holding or the discharge signal for this. So when this is low, it's discharging the cap. And when it's high, it's allowing the cap to charge up. When the, when the cap charges up to the threshold, it triggers this and stays there until, so, so what do we have here? Right, this is the exclusive OR on the output, the exclusive OR. So this was low and I'm trying to think. It, it's the exclusive OR, these two. It's the exclusive OR at this and this. So it's high and when they're both the same, then it's low. Same thing here, both high or high and a low, and it goes high and a low and a low, and it goes low. So it alternates back and forth. And the CLC2 is just a simple little pulse there to trigger that, that flip flop. This is your this is your PWM output, okay? And these are just the intermediate signals. This is this is the signal. Uh, like if I go back oh, to right, CLC2, yeah. that's just that's just the holding signal here for this. So this first sentence is a little bit uh, confusing when I, every time I read it, I don't know what it's telling me, but it's essentially just that we have the exclusive OR of the input and the intermediate holding stage that comprises the PWM output. And the period is determined by the AC input through the ZCD. Uh, duty cycle is generated by a constant, cur uh, constant current charge of the cap. And the duty cycle is determined by the 10 bit PWM voltage uh, coming from that other uh, section. Any questions about any of this? OK, I, I just want to mention this, that one of my critiques is I go too fast. So if I'm going too fast for anybody, feel free to shout out, slow down. Because I tend, I tend to speed up. Yes? Yes, I consider it like, like anything else with, with a microcontroller, there must be 10 or 20 different ways of doing it. Yeah. So, so feel free to use your imagination. Right. Yeah, but that's a good point. I mean, there's, there's more than one solution here. This, is, this just happened to be the one that came to my mind at the time. And if you think of others, then feel free to, to let me know because every, all the inputs are good. So the next third application here is a servo pulse measurement circuit. Does anybody here do model airplanes, radio-controlled airplanes, radio-controlled boats, radio-controlled cars, that sort of thing? So you're probably familiar with this, this application. It's to capture a pulse from a pulse stream and provide a measurement count. And that's used coming out of the receiver. Uh, well, I'll get to that in a second here. But that uses the CLC, a timer counter, and a numerically controlled oscillator. And the idea here is that coming out of the receiver, from the radio control receiver is this pulse stream. And it has these little pulses on it. 
This is the edge of the next pulse, so it's just, it's just this waveform repeats. There's another pulse here, just like that. This 18 to 20 milliseconds really doesn't matter. It could have been 10 milliseconds to 100 milliseconds. This part doesn't count. It, everything is contained in this pulse width. So we want to be able to measure this pulse width and do something with it. Control a, an aileron or a motor speed control or whatever. Um, and we're going to do that. The shortest it can be is one millisecond, and the longest it can be is two milliseconds. So if you've got it's like an aileron control, that at one millisecond it might be here, and at two milliseconds it's here, and it places in between, it goes up and down. So we're going to do that with three CLCs. This is a gate that's going to feed my counter, and it's going to be controlled by uh, these two flip flops. Now, the numerically controlled oscillator is an advantage because I can set that to any frequency. It gives me linear control over frequency. So let's think about this. We've got an 8-bit counter. What's the maximum count I can have in an 8-bit counter? Somebody. 255. 255, 0 to 255, which means that I'm going to count somewhere between 0 and 255 with my 1 millisecond difference. So if I want 1 millisecond to be my maximum count, what does my NCO frequency have to be? So to give me, I'm going to say, let's go to 200 counts, and we'll see why that's important. But I'm going to go to 200 counts in one millisecond. What does my NCO frequency have to be? Somebody. 200 kilohertz, good. So 200 kilohertz coming through here gated by this. So the pulse comes in. The pulse comes in. This is tied to a 1. So on the rising edge of the pulse, this is going to go high. This started out low, so I've got a high and a low. So this starts counting, and when the pulse falls, it comes into this flip-flop and gates this high on the negative edge. So now I've got a high and a high, whereas I had a high and a low, so that stops counting. Okay? Here's an important thing to look at, gate 3 polarity. These are two separate CLCs. The gate 3 polarity are those bubbles on the outputs, right? I'm going to use those to reset the circuit when it's finished or to, to set it up to initialize it, I've got two separate controls. I can't do them simultaneously. So it's important how I reset this. So I, I would normally ask this as a question, but I, I, I'm, I'm worried we're going to run out of time. So I'll just give you the answer. I need to set and hold this one high first to keep this in reset. So this goes up. Because if I, if I set this one first, if I reset this one first, and this one's sitting high, I'd, I'd re-trigger this and start to, to count. So what I need to do is set this one, hold it hot, hold it, hold it low, so that goes low first, then reset this one so it goes low, and then release this one, and then release this one last. And now I'm set up for the next pulse. So even if a pulse comes in the middle of the sequence, I'm, I'm prevented from having something bad happen, uh, or, or the counting extraneous pulses during my reset. There's another line here. Anybody know what this, what this line does? This is also important, this configuration here. I mean, certainly I could have tied this one high and just had this one and this one. But by doing this, I prevent, if my reset goes away in the middle of my pulse, I prevent this one from triggering first and this one second. Because if that happened, then it would look like I got a, a, a pulse measurement when I didn't. So by tying this one, I prevent this one from happening first. This one has to happen first and then followed by this one. So here's the timing diagram of all that. So Q1 goes high on the rising edge of this, opens my gate, starts counting. Then on the falling edge, Q2 goes high, turns the gate off. Now it stays like this forever. And I could set up this CLC to be an interrupt when it goes high so that as soon as I know I get this one, my interrupt tells me my measurement is in my timer and ready to, to be uh, retrieved. I go retrieve my measurement and reset everything, and I'm ready for the next pulse. Let's go back and look at this. Now, remember, my minimum pulse is one millisecond. I'm trying to measure a millisecond difference, but I'm starting out. I've got at least a millisecond, and I can go up to two milliseconds. I've got a 200 kilohertz signal coming in here, which means my count is going to go to 400. So what do I do about that? I want my count to start at zero after one millisecond. Anybody have an idea on how to do that? Okay, 
I can, I can clear this, I can also preset this. What number could I preset this to to give me a zero count after one millisecond? Somebody. Well, actually, it's plus minus 200, which in actually that's the right answer, but it's a funny way of thinking about it because minus 200 in uh, in 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 what do you call it in in integer positive logic is 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 plus 55, right? Yeah. No, so it's a plus 55. If I if I preset this to plus 55, which is a minus 200, then then this thing will roll over after one millisecond and I'll be starting at zero. So that my count is a direct measurement here just, but just by presetting this to a number. Now there's another problem to consider, which is what if my, nothing's perfect, right? I don't have exactly one millisecond. My timers aren't exactly 200 kilohertz. What happens if the count or that pulse is less than one millisecond, which it certainly could be, and I preset this to 55, I'm not gonna quite get to the overflow and my count's gonna be some large number close to 255. And at the other extreme, if my two, mil or my, my, my two millisecond pulse is a little longer than two milliseconds, I'm going to also count above 200. But the difference is that when it goes too long, my count is a little more than 200 and my, when my count is too short, it's a little less than 255. So the, the divider between there, if I'm, I'm at that, that number between 200 and 250, or 200, what is that, off the, off the line, 225, or 227, 227 and a half. So if I'm at 227 and a half, if I'm less than 227 and a half, then that says that my counter overflowed, I'm at the maximum count, and if it's between 227 and 255, that means that the pulse was too short and I'm actually at the zero limit, so I've got, I've covered that case. So they do, you do have some tolerance here just by, you still a little bit of software to do on the number at the end, but that's the reason for having a 200 count here instead of 255. Any questions about this? So we have the NCO provides a proper frequency for direct measurement. We have the CLC to provide a single gated burst of the NC output to the counter input and the counter holds the measurement value until read and reset. So the idea is that I just set it up, go off, do something else. When I get the interrupt, read the value, reset it up, go off and do something else like motor control or whatever you're gonna do. Three phase latch shutdown. It's another solution to a problem. So the purpose in my three phase system, I've got COGs. The COGs are independent. And I need to be able to start, in a three-phase system, all three COGs simultaneously. So I need simultaneous start and stop control of the three-phase output. And I want to coordinate that software startup and shutdown with a hardware startup and shutdown. I'm going to use the CLC, DAC, the comparator, COG, which is the complementary output generator. That, that's half bridges, so my AC thing is being driven by three half bridges and a programmable rate generator. And we'll see what all these things are. So here's a very simplified diagram of it. What we have is an AC source. In this case, the AC source is, it's a three AC sources. It's a magnet with three linear Hall effect sensors on it. it. Gives me three phases. I have three DACs here that I can control. The DACs, one side is reference to an, another DAC. So the, this DAC is set at the midpoint of the peak to peak voltage here. And I can control this, so when I'm all the way at this extreme, then I'm in the middle of this triangle waveform coming out here, so I've got a 50% duty cycle coming out of my COGs. When, as I move this up, at the other extreme, I've got the AC signal, so it's, it's going between the two extremes here, and I get a pulse width modulated AC waveform coming out of my COGs, so everything in between. So there's three stages here, three comparators, three COGs, three DACs, and one PRG to control this uh, triangle waveform. The PRG gives me this nice linear triangle waveform here. There's actually more, more to this. There's comparators over here that, that set these limits, so this thing bounces between those two. So the issue here is that since these are three independent COGs, 
I need to be able to start them simultaneously because if I, if I say start one, then two, then three in a software sequence, what will happen is my motor will do funny things. It will jump. The two of the, two of the term, terminals have a voltage on them and one of them doesn't, so it, it kind of bounces around kind of violently because it's 50% duty cycle. Uh, I need to be able to start them simultaneously. I also need to be able to shut them down. And if I shut them down, I want them to stay shut down until I do something about it. Now there's the controls here for starting simultaneously. There's a called auto shutdown with a auto restart. And auto restart says that when I release the shutdown signal, then the next PWM signal coming in, they will start. So I need that for startup. I need the auto start on, at, after auto shutdown. But if I configure this for auto restart, that means if I have a fault input that's only there for a short period of time, it will shut down, then restart, then shut down and restart and bounce back and forth. So I need, I need both configurations. I need auto restart, and I also need not auto restart. And I solve that problem by adding the CLC down in here. So this now, all three of these are configured with the shutdown and auto restart, but I'm going to use this to latch the fault signal if it comes in. So if I get a fault that's above some reference level, it'll shut it down and keep it there. But I also have software control over this and a software reset on the CLC. So what's inside here? And again, very simple, next to nothing to it. It's just this OR gate. So a shutdown is when this is high, so I invert my software input. If the fault is low and this goes high, then this will go low, removing the shutdown. And when this goes low, then this is low, and this is low. It's also, it's also not shut down. How do I do that? I just confused myself here. When this, is, no, when this is low, then this is high. There you go. So I shut down when this is low. And I'll also shut down if this is high, regardless of what this is. So a set reset here. I can reset, the reset on this with the software reset to remove the fault. Otherwise, the fault stays keeps this in shut down. Now the dilemma with this, I just want to mention this, um, at the time I made this slide, this was an okay solution, but it turned out that in this particular application, I needed one more CLC. I'm using two here. I'm using a third one, actually, because the three COGs are, are separated. I've got two of them can get their inputs from from two CLCs and the, the other two, uh, the other one gets this input from another CLC. So I had to, I couldn't use one CLC for all three. I had to actually use another CLC just to route this signal to the other COG. So I used three. I forget what the third, the, the fourth one is, but I'm using three just for the COG uh, start, uh, start up and shutdowns <laughs> and, and the third one for something else. And it turns out I needed a fifth one because I needed to divide the signal by two. So then what that forces you to do is be creative and think a little bit more that maybe I can reduce this somehow. And I thought about it. And I can actually do this with one CLC. Does anybody know how I can do that? It, it's probably, that's kind of a tough question because if you don't have all those eight different configurations in the back of your head that it's hard to think of solutions. But the solution was this, that instead of having two gates here, if I just have one flip-flop like this, then I could start on the rising edge, this plus the input on the D here, a start rising edge on the start will make this go high. Of course, it's inverted, so I, I remove shutdown. But if I ever get a fault, then this will force this low and keep it there. <coughs> and if it stays faulted, I can't restart. I can't restart until the fault goes away or until the software says now it's time to start. So I've reduced this to one and bring up another CLC for my divide by two. Any questions about any of that? So the COGs are configured for auto restart. Remember, because we need that for synchronous start. CLC one latches the fault shutdown. CLC two ors the latch shutdown. So this is the two CLC solution. And all three phases start and stop simultaneously, so I've solved that problem. And that's it for my application. Any question about any of this or anything in general about CLCs? Okay, so I'll hand it back to, to Daniel and 
we go through this shuffle here again. I was still falling. I know you, you, you must know that uh, it's going to be more techni te technical when this guy talks, right? So I'm not that experienced as what is, so I don't have that many good application stories by myself. So I'm going to stick with the, our existing app nodes. So here is an application with high resolution PWM based on AN1476. So when talking about the PWM, anybody know that uh, what's the highest uh, resolution we have for our devices, uh, 8-bit devices now for the PWM? 16? Yes. So with this application, we can get the, app, uh, get the resolution for uh, 0 duty cycle to 100 duty cycle PWM up to 20 bits. So that's how we do it. Okay, in the PIC my controller, we have two CLCs, one D-latch, <coughs> and uh, I'm going to ask you guys a question. So if I think about it, you really need two things to generate a PWM. What are the two things that you can think of? So you, what you need, really need is two things or two parameters to generate a PWM thing, signal, right? <laughs> so, yeah. So basically, you need a period, and then you need amount of on time to apply to that. Then you have a duty cycle, right? So how do we get these two things based on this application? We have a period source that can be generated by integrated analog, can be timer based and even an external signal. And that, we can use that to be our period here. <coughs> if you look at the output here, <coughs> your period signal is going to have a rising edge coming into CLC1, going through a D-latch. And now the output of CLC1 is going to be turned high. And then we have the NCO in the, in the bottom. So when so we, when we cl uh, connect the system clock to CLC2, and we have high here, then there's an end gate here. So it starts clocking into the NCO. So basically, in this application, we're just using the NCO as a counter. The NCO register, I mean the frequency or period register, is 20 bit. So we're going to use the NCO to set a 20 bit value into the register to have it incrementing. So when the NCO increments, the output still st stays high. And now when the NCO overflows, meaning that if we set a, a value in that register and it reaches that value, then it's going to reset D-latch. The resetting of the D-latch is going to turn the signal off. That's how we get the falling edge. So with those two things, one periodic source and one NCO, we're going to have one on time and one period of our PWM. That's for, that forms the high resolution PWM for us. Any questions on this? But you can, you can have that for any period, yeah? Yes. You can. So you have this. Limitation in the period here. Right. The question is that. Uh, what, what's the limitation of the period, right? So the NCO has such a, uh, the highest or, or the, the longest period it can get. So in order to achieve a 100 duty cycle, you need to set the period source to be the same period as the NCO, the, the longest it can get. But in your own applications, if you don't require a PWM to be at a um, 100 duty cycle, it might be from 0 to 50 duty cycle, then you can set your period source to be twice as long as the NCO period. And then you're getting even more resolution, more than 20 bits of your PWM in that way. Does that answer the question? Okay. All right. Uh, a quick summary of this application. So in this ap application, we're seeing that we combine NCO and CLC, probably an HLT, the hardware limit timer for the period source. 
We combine those three and actually form a customized peripheral for ourselves. It's called high resolution PWM. With this peripheral, it's all hardware and you can easily just set the period of the HLT and then the register in the NCO to get your PWM output. So it's a customized peripheral just for your application. All right, the next app node I'm, I want to talk about is the RGB lighting app node. It's, uh, it's in AN1890. Here's the purpose of this application. Also, a customized peripheral for by transmitting using the WS2811. So I'm going to talk about the WS2811 or 12 protocol later. The purpose is to create a customized peripheral so that you don't need to bit band to create your signal for the RGB light. We have three CIPs involved, CLC, SPI, and then PWM. When the SPI shows up, you probably kind of sense how we're going to do it. All right. If you will, just ignore the fancy marketing <laughs> slide here. Uh, what's the real application is like is we have a light sensor, and it's going to read the ambient light, and then we're going to change the screen based on the light in intensity, right? So if you look into this uh, matrix, this is what it's formed of. So we have a string of the WS2811 or 2812 connected together. So you can pass your signal to the first one to the last one to light up the whole screen. Any questions on that? All right. If you take a look into the protocol here, how the WS28 works is that uh, it has a wide pulse for the logic one and then a narrow pulse for the logic zero. And they are in the same, they are in the same period. So they're using the same period. Only it's the uh, duty cycle that changes. So as we talked before, we always have the typical solution or traditional solution first. So a software, software solution to do that, you know, um, in the upper part, it's all the same. So read the ambient light and then pass the parameters into this pixel update function. That's going to update all the pixels. So if you take, take a look into that, we have the pixel and then uh, whether it's the last byte, the last byte meaning the last byte of the transmission of the string of the RGB light, and then we're going set, set to be, set the output to be low to reset the screen and do another refresh. That looks pretty simple, right? But really, the complex thing is in, the, in this function called transmit byte here. So if I take a further step into that, you can see the, this code looks like a, a spaghetti here. And who can, so I, I know it's a little bit small for you guys in the back, but uh, who can tell me what it's really doing here? So it's a setting a bit, and then set it high to be a amount of time, and then set it low, and then set it high to a bit to be a amount of time, and set it low. So actually, we're doing the bit banding here. So we're bit banding every bit that we need to transfer into the RGB light that uses the full resource of the CPU. Okay. So how do we replace it? As easy as that. We have a larger combination of the CIP, uh, I'm sorry, C, uh, SPI signal, two signals, one clock and one output, and the PWM signal. So how do, do we achieve the logic here? If you take a look at the very bottom, this is the protocol of the WS2812 or 2811. We have the logic one here. I'll probably borrow a word thing. Yeah. So. We have a logic one here with a wide pulse. We have a logic zero here with a narrow pulse. So this is showing one zero zero one one zero, um, probably a bit in the very last. So this is one byte transmission. So how do we do that? At the top, we have the SPI clock signal, and then the SPI out signal. 
what we want to do is to use the SPI output logic one to be our logic one here, and then use the PW. So when the SPI is outputting zero here, we also want the logic zero here. Only that the logic zero for this protocol is a narrow pulse. So we're going to use a PWM with a, a low duty cycle to replace the narrow pulse. So how the thing works is that if you see a SPI clock signal with the output signal and uh, end them together, it's going to give you a clock signal here, which is 50% duty cycle as the wide pulse whenever there is an output of one. And how do we get the logic zero here is to do this kind of uh, combination so that I have the clock and the uh, invert of the output, which gives, you, which gives you a one here, and the PWM. So once there's a zero here in that clock, clock um, area, the PWM is going to be output as zero. And simply just all the, all the two signals here together is going to give, you us, give us the right output. This is also going to be introduced in the upcoming class, the CIP3, the data communication. So with that being said, once we use the SPI to transmit one byte of signal here, we're going to get one byte of signal to the, into the RGB light. So basically, we, we pr we're we replacing the transmit byte in the pixel update function with this kind of peripheral-based block. And then it's going to do the job for us. And all you need to do is to write one byte into your SPI peripheral, and it's going to automatically trans uh, transfer that into the WS2812 protocol. Yes? So I have a question. So are all these WS2811s get the same data stream? Yes. How does the pixel know that the data is for it? So how the WS2812 or 11 works is that no matter how many lights are connected together, it's going to accept one long stream. Say you need three bytes of signals to, to, uh, for one uh, RGB light, right? So, so if you hook two RGB lights together, you're going to transmit six bytes at one time, and then you're going to put the, uh, put your output low for amount of time, tells the system to reset. So how does, that, how does the first pixel know what's for it, and the last pixel know what's for it? So, when the, la so the first pixel uh, accepts the signal, and then it's, it's saying that, uh, OK, there are more signals coming, and there is no low signal there, so I'm not going to reset. So I'm going to pass the s rest of the signal onto the next uh, light. So it just takes the first little bit and then passes everything else? Yes. And then the next one takes the next first little bit and, and passes pass everything out. else until it gets a reset. Then it, it, it stops passing on the signals. I'm so confused because that means the second one got the same signal as the first one. Uh, no, the second one gets. So the first one. The first one doesn't pass the signal until it's. Until it's finished, is that how it works? Uh, the the first one passes on the signal into the second one until it gets a reset. Then it knows that the last signal it gets is the signal for 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 it for itself. So the, the, I'm, so I'm trying to imagine how this works. So if the first one, if whatever they are, they accept the signal. Yes. But they don't pass it until. They oh, they pass the signal. They, they pass what uh, they get. They don't pass the signal until they until get a they, reset. Until they take it, well, so they get a reset. The first guy gets his eight bits or whatever it is. Yes. Those same eight bits go out or they don't go out. The next eight bits go out. So let me draw something. The first eight bits is not passing it through. Right. That, is correct? That makes sense. The first eight yeah. bits is not passing through. So whatever, so the last guy only sees the last eight bits. He doesn't see any of the bits before that. Right, right. And the second guy only sees everything after the first, the first eight bit. bits. Yes, so every so every light grabs parts. three bytes of the signal, right. and then they, they pass they, the rest. Once, once they grab their parts, their, their part, they they start sending whatever else comes through. Yes. They don't send through what, what they need. Right. OK, I get it. OK. Yes. 
<coughs> so any questions on this application? All right. With the usage of these three blocks, we had you can see the CPU burden is released because before we actually are using the CPU the whole time to do the bit banning. And after the two 8-bit uh, application nodes I've been introducing, I'm going to pass on to Justin, and he's going to introduce to you guys some 16-bit applications. So in, in that case, if I have, uh, let's say, 128 bit, I have 128 left, uh, I would have to have 128 bit WS2811. Yes. Too expensive, huh? Right. <laughs> Well, each slide is going to uh, grab three bytes of signal, replacing, uh, re <coughs> representing the value of your RGB. So you adjust the, the, bat, the byte value there to adjust the RGB, so red, blue, green values, and then it's going to form a signal. So each of the WS2812 is actually three uh, LEDs. So I'm going to pass on to Justin. All right. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? <coughs> Again, my name is Justin O'Shea. I'm from uh, MCU 16 Division. And today we're going to go over uh, some of the application examples that are in AppNote 2133. So 2133 actually has uh, six different applications in it. So I suggest you take a look at that. There's some other good information in it. And in addition to that, AppNote, there's actually uh, at least two others that deal just with the CLC that are from the 16-bit uh, division. There's also a tips and tricks document that has a lot of good stuff in it. And there's also a family reference manual, or FRM, which we write for all of the peripherals. Uh, we do that so the data sheets aren't a thousand pages. But interestingly, for the CLC, that FRM is probably almost completely replaced by this. And the MCC tool makes it 100 times easier to use than trying to program the registers yourself. So I highly suggest that you uh, install the MCC plugin if you're going to use a CLC. Uh, it's a great improvement. All right, let's get started. So uh, our first one we're going to look at today is a phase detector. So what is a phase detector? Uh, well, it's going to identify the difference in phase of two signals, and in this case we're going to use the zero crossing as the reference point of our signals, and then we're going to get, uh, we're going to quantify the offset and, and identify which signal is either leading or <coughs> lagging. Where would that be useful? No, oh, lots of places. So energy metering and digital power, including doing power factor correction. It's used in communications. It's one of the fundamental pieces of a PLL. And you could even use it for a distance measurement, which we'll talk about a little bit in a minute. CIPs we're going to use here are the comparators, CLCs, and the input capture. <coughs> so here we have a block diagram of the whole system. And uh, one thing I like to point out is that our 16-bit products don't have a zero cross detect peripheral, so that tool, I guess, is not available. And in this case, we're going to use a comparator to do that function. So here the comparators are set up to trip on the uh, zero cross. Those signals are fed into one of the CLCs that is going to perform an XOR to get the magnitude of the difference. We're going to use the input capture module to then take that pulse width and quantify it versus the system clock to get a magnitude. So you could convert that into degrees or radians or milliseconds or whatever. And CLC2 is configured as a flip-flop to give us which direction or which signal is leading or lagging. So here we have a little state diagram that kind of shows how this circuit works. So here this line, we see our first comparator trip on signal one as it rises. And this line corresponds to uh, comparator two tripping. 
and CLC1 again is the XOR, so we see the magnitude of the difference. And the bottom line here is, is the flip-flop, so on the rising edge of CLC2, it latches that in there, and we get the direction from that. So one of the uses examples in the app note of a phase detector is doing a distance measurement. There's lots of ways to do it. This particular way is using a continuous signal transmitted and also receiving it back and calculating the phase difference from that. So to determine the distance using this method, we have the equation here where we'll replace the wavelength with C over F. It allows us to calculate the distance in, in meters. There's a couple limitations with doing it this way, such as the maximum distance. We can see from the math that when our phase becomes a whole wavelength of 2 pi, that our maximum distance is, is a half a wavelength. So going out and reflecting, coming back. And there's a limit, limitation to the resolution as well, um, which is mainly imposed by the input capture. How fast can you run the input capture? What's the minimum period you can detect? And how many of them? Any questions on the phase detector or distance measurement? All right, our next example from 2133 is a two to one multiplexer. Yeah, so the question is, uh, how, how is that working? And yeah, so the transmit wave is, is a continuous wave and it's being sampled as well as the receive signal at all times, basically. So the question is, why not use TDR? Um, well, there's lots of ways to do it. Um, that might be a better way, depending on the application. Uh, this is just one of the methods that was uh, presented in the app note. So uh, there's also ultrasonic or lasers, lots of ways. So any other questions? All right. So back to our multiplexer. Um, so. It, here we have two to one multiplexer. It's not the most exciting circuit. Uh, certainly not as complicated as what Ward has shown us, but it certainly can be useful. It can double the number of in inputs that feed a limited resource. So perhaps an example of maybe when that would be useful is your product may have a very solid and well thought out uh, design specification, and you go ahead and begin to implement that hardware, software. And your marketing guy goes out on the road, comes back with some feature creep and says, we need one more input. Well, sometimes the CLC might be a creative way for you to use hardware instead of maybe adding components to your board or having to uh, make other changes in your software. Um, it might be a you know, solution to some odd problems that come along the way during development. So again, uh, it can be used for signal selection and you know, sharing of a single data line or some resource. This diagram shows the logic equation. We could use MCC to uh, create it, pretty simple. Um, one of the other points I wanted to talk about here is the CLC has, a, uh, has an inverter or an inversion on every input, and that can be pretty useful. It can be even useful if you only, if you only want an inverter um, I've even done that myself where I on, the only thing I do with the CLC is make an inverter out of it. It's an easy way to get a complementary signal if you want to drive an H bridge. Uh, the CLC is, a, is digital, so a lot of, most of the time it's on PPS and you can easily put it on the pin you want, so pretty useful. So here we have our uh, block diagram and we can see how close it is to 
and one of the uh, functions or modes that the CLC operates in. It's almost identical. A usage, usage example of the multiplexer could be a clock source selection and the comparators used uh, to, to, to steer it, basically. And uh, this can all be in hardware. We actually have it coming out an output pin on the device. Um, FSK is something that you could implement using a scheme like that, used for caller ID back in the day. Any questions on the multiplexer? All right, our last one that we're gonna talk about today from 2133 is uh, called multiple parameter monitoring. What is that? Well, it's using only hardware to detect an event or multiple events and take action. Versus digital number 2133. <coughs> so why is, uh, why is it useful to use hardware? Well, it's kind of the point of the class of core dependent. Uh, you don't need to use a CPU to uh, pull uh, a pin or perhaps even miss an event. And uh, you don't have to use interrupts. One other way to detect events might be to use change notification, but again, you have to you know, service that interrupt and use a CPU. So this method would allow you to use only hardware. So how this works, <coughs> we're gonna use a comparator to detect an event, and we can use more than one, and we can take necessary action when we <coughs> see uh, one of the parameters exceed a limit. So this type of system is used in fault monitoring. It could be used for event capture, to be able to maybe qualify a signal with another. And again, we're gonna use the CLC combined with the comparator to implement it. So here we have our simple block diagram and we have our signals compared to some analog reference so you can set your threshold. And the CLC is just gonna OR those two uh, outputs from the comparators together. And that can go out to a pin. You could also use it to, you know, use an interrupt, or you could send that to some other peripheral to, you know, trigger an A to D or whatever you want to do. A usage ex example of parameter modeling might be for a, uh, you know, a, some sort of manufacturing plant with uh, temperature and pressure sensors looking for some kind of fault condition, and they can be used to shut down the plant without any software running. So you don't have to worry about your software getting lost in the weeds or watchdog timers or any of that. It's just done in hardware. <coughs> Another one would be over under voltage detection. So you could set up the comparators in a window fashion and <coughs> use it for something like a UPS, uninterruptible power supply in an application like this. It's gonna sense the main voltage and switch over to battery if the voltage is either too high or too low. And I think that's about it. Any questions on multiple parameter modeling, monitoring? All right, well, I think that's it for me. Um, again, I encourage you to take a look at uh, some of the other material that's on the microchip website for the CLC and to uh, remember it's there. Typically our devices have four CLCs and Pretty much everything that is coming in the future will always have CLCs. They have proven to be uh, very useful for a lot of customers' applications. All right, thank you. Uh, yeah, that's a very good question, and uh, there's actually, <laughs> I believe that's one of the uh, application examples in, was it uh, CIP3? Two. two. So there's a class, uh, CIP2 class, which I believe is right after this one, Yes. which is taught by Priya, who's sitting in our room, and he will go over that uh, very application, so good question.
Did everyone hear, hear his question? Bob now. So today we've covered how to configure the CLC using the MCC. We have the thing on my left hand here. Um, we also have some MCC classes. I think we have MCC class every day. So if you're, in, you're specifically interested in this graphical tool, it's very useful for us. And I encourage you to go to one of those class at least once. And then we also have the open lab session for all the CIP classes. All the 8-bit sessions of those labs is going to use MCC to configure your applications. The RGB lighting uh, application I talked about is going to be in the lab. So you, if you're interested in configure and light up the RGB light by yourself, please go to that open lab session. OK, some additional resources. Here are the three other classes. We have the upcoming CIP2, which is on mode control. We have the CIP for data communication and mixed signal. And then we have also we have the open lab. I, I, I believe it's on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday afternoon, uh, start from 3.30. So you're welcome to join us anytime you want. Also, the website, you can search CLC at mapchip.com straightforward and easy to get more CLC design tips and the app notes based on that. Here are the three application notes number we talked about in today's class. So feel free to take any notes if you want to. All right. And here are the dev tools we're going to use for the labs, open lab session. We're going to use the Explorer 16 for the 16-bit lab. We're going to use the Curiosity Board for the 8-bit lab. Also, the, we're going to use the microelectronica RGB light click to do the uh, RGB light lab. Nobody cares about that? <laughs> I think we ended a little bit earlier. So anybody has any questions, please? Yes? What's the um, typical number of CLCs you get on a processor at a number maximum? Um, I think we have. It depends from on the microcontroller. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Most Normally we have two or four. I think. Uh, most right. of them have four. Some, some with one, some with two, and some with three, but most of them 